Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Ron Feldman. I work here at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, and I want to uh, welcome and thank you for attending our session on rent stabilization. Uh, we're doing this in partnership with ULI, and I want to thank Stephanie Brown, who's been a great partner on this. Um, and I think the last time we did something like this uh, was on uh, inclu inclusionary zoning. And I think at the time, uh, we thought, uh, you might have said, you know, why is the Fed involved in this kind of activity? Well, because frankly, uh, housing is the number one related issue. Anything related to housing is the number one related issue we hear when we're out in the community, in the Twin Cities, Minnesota, the Dakotas, Montana, our entire district, rural, urban is the number one issue. You, you might think that uh, if we went out today, we would hear mostly about inflation. Um, and the truth is, even when we hear about inflation today, oftentimes it's in the context of housing. So housing policy and anything related to housing market dynamics is really critical for us to understand. And so we're really pleased to host this today. We've got a very full agenda. Um, and so why don't we uh, start right into it? And I'm gonna have the pleasure of introducing our, uh, for our keynote speaker, it's Sophie House. Uh, she is uh, at the Furman Center um, um, and you can read her bio uh, in more detail. Um, and so uh, trying to get right to the point, I'm gonna turn it over to Sophie to set us off. Thank you, Ron. And thank you so much to the organizers and our hosts um, and panelists. I'm going to share my screen. Great, so I'm Sophie House. As Ron mentioned, I'm the Law and Policy Director at the Furman Center's Housing Solutions Lab, um, where we work with cities across the country on policies to advance housing stability affordability um, and access to opportunity. And today I'll be providing an overview of, um, we call the building blocks of rent regulation. And I'll talk about how cities across the country use them to create different rent regulation regimes. Um, and where I want us to go with this uh, is basically to think, think about the fact that jurisdictions can and do make uh, many different choices in designing and implementing rent regulations. That each of these choices um, has a trade-off, and that the different components of rent regulations work together and each contribute to the overall effect um, of the regulation. So we need to think about them in context. And at the end, I'll provide just a brief introduction to the research base um, to uh, lead us into our conversation with Libby, Jenny, and Ed. So we can think of these as, as sort of the three basic questions of rent regulation um, that will we'll anchor our discussion today. Um, and I'll follow them to look into a number of other more specific choices and trade-offs, but essentially we have to think about uh, which properties to apply rent regulations to, how to regulate rents, and how to administer uh, and enforce the system that you've created. When it comes to the universe of regulated properties, the basic trade-off is that regulating more properties creates more uniform protections, um, but risks discouraging new construction. And jurisdictions take different approaches to that trade-off. California and Oregon, for example, um, both fairly recently enacted rent regulations that um, apply essentially to all housing statewide, all rental housing statewide, um, but do so with a high rent cap. So in California, um, California's statewide anti-gouging rent regulation um, regulates rents basically at a level of 5% um, of annual rent plus the increase in the Consumer Protection Index or CPI. We can talk about more about some of these details later, but um, in Oregon, the um, basic annual rent increase is 7% plus CPI and those apply across the state. Places that regulate rents more strictly tend to exempt different categories of properties or landlords, provide ways for buildings to leave the regulated stock um, or some combination of both. So common exemptions from rent regulation include new construction. Exempting new construction protects current tenants who are in their units um, while encouraging new construction to increase or maintain the rental housing supply. Many jurisdictions exempt new construction categorically, um, but others do so only for a period of time. For example, uh, Newark, New Jersey, and Tacoma Park, Maryland, both provide, um, both exempt new construction only for a certain number of years after that construction um, is on the market for say um, 10 years, it becomes regulated. 
Um, and others regulate new construction only in certain areas. So Jersey City, for example, exempts new construction only in statutorily designated redevelopment areas. Some jurisdictions exempt smaller properties or smaller landlords um, in order to minimize the costs or regulatory burdens um, for smaller landlords or try to preserve or encourage the development of smaller buildings. Jurisdictions also build in ways for properties to become deregulated. Um, some examples of common deregulatory mechanisms include deregulation when landlords convert buildings to convert uh, rental units into co-ops or condos or into commercial or professional spaces, um, deregulation when owners move into properties themselves, um, and deregulation when buildings are condemned, demolished, or rehabilitated. And when we look at how different jurisdictions have managed these, um, have crafted these sort of pathways out of rent regulation, some like Washington DC condition deregulation on landlords paying, uh, paying relocation expenses for tenants. Um, and in general, you know, the trade-off that, um, that we see here is that providing more of these mechanisms can mitigate the extent to which regulation discourages production. So if you provide more pathways out of regulation, um, you're sort of loosening, the, um, loosening some of those market distorting effects potentially. Um, but also decreases the stock of rent regulated housing. Um, and in 2019, New York State got rid of several deregulatory mechanisms in its rent regulation program, including deregulation at vacancy when, when rents reached a particular threshold and deregulation during tenancy for tenants whose incomes and rents reached uh, both reached certain levels. So second sort of um, umbrella of questions concerns how to regulate rents and determine rent increases. And in general, uh, higher rent ceilings are less protective. They leave tenants more vulnerable to rent spikes, um, but have fewer market distorting effects. Lower ceilings give more protection against rent spikes, um, but again, can provide more constraints on markets. Um, and the first basic question is what is the increase that landlords can take as of right in any given year. Almost all jurisdictions peg rent increases to some measure of inflation or consumer prices. The most common formula that we see is some percentage of annual rent plus the increase in the CPI. Um, there are some different ways of doing this. In New York City, uh, um, the mayor appoints a rent guidelines board who determine annual increases for the regulated stock, which is an approach that um, can sometimes be more flexible and locally sensitive and can also at times be more opaque and introduces political dynamics into a process uh, into the process in a different way um, than a than a fixed above the, across the board increase. Um, but there are also generally a lot of other um, there are a lot of other ways that rents can increase beyond that base annual rate. Uh, so one set of questions is is, do jurisdictions allow for a larger increase at vacancy? In California, the Costa-Hawkins Act allows for um, increases to market rate at vacancy statewide. And one reason to do this is to provide sitting tenants with the benefits of lower rents while allowing landlords to um, recover some foregone income um, or essentially allow rents to catch up to market rates when a current tenant leaves. But um, as we might imagine, um, vacancy deregulations can risk incentivizing landlords to push out current tenants in order to reset rents to market level. Um, some different approaches here, Washington DC pegs the size of the increase that a landlord can take at vacancy to the duration of, uh, to how long the current tenant, the one who's leaving, um, has lived in a unit. So um, if a tenant who has lived in a unit for 10 years moves out, a landlord can take a larger increase than, if a, than when a, a tenant who's lived in the unit for one year moves out. Um, many regimes will um, provide for larger increases when landlords make improvements to a building or a unit. Um, and in general, you, you, know, you need some way for landlords to recoup costs. You want to encourage investment in, um, investment in buildings and in apartments, 
but don't want incentives to be so great that they encourage frivolous improvements. In other words, improvements that tenants um, might not want or need. Um, and definitely don't want incentives to be so great that um, landlords are incentivized to make them just to increase rents. Mechanically, these increases are usually calculated um, by amortizing the costs of an improvement over a certain number of months. Um, jurisdictions can make different choices with respect to the percentage of costs that landlords can ultimately recover, um, how long increases last, and whether they can be applied retroactively. Uh, next, I want to mention special protections for particular groups. So rent regulation is not means tested in the United States. New York and DC, uh, however, have rent freezing programs for renters who are elderly or have disabilities. And those programs freeze rent at their current levels. Um, and then going forward, cover the gap between the frozen rent and the um, legal rent. By, uh, with a property tax credit. And this is one attempt to bring some kind of targeted uh, relief or protections into rent regulation schemes. Um, and finally, uh, rent regulation schemes have to have some process for allowing landlords to apply for increases or variances if the base rate won't allow them to earn um, a fair income after operating expenses. Otherwise, we run into issues with the takings clause. It's our um, daily constitutional law lesson. And here I'll be brief, but a last set of questions concerns administration and enforcement. So how do jurisdictions ensure compliance with rent regulations? Um, how do they find out about overcharges? How do they verify the improvements that landlords, um, on, you know, based on which landlords are claiming um, a need for rent increases? Do they verify them at all? Um, jurisdictions can, can choose to enforce rent regulations at the state level, as we do in New York, or at the local level in New Jersey. Um, and, and more broader questions here concern what kinds of recourse do tenants have? Can they bring affirmative challenges to violations of rent regulations? Are they only permitted to raise, um, to raise violations of rent regulations as a defense during an eviction proceeding? Who else can enforce rent regulation laws? Um, city attorneys, uh, nonprofit tenant advocacy organizations. Um, a lot of that will be, um, those, those questions are also very related to the kind of um, relief or penalties that suing parties can collect for noncompliance. So can tenants collect past rent overcharges? How far back can they go? Um, are attorneys fees and civil penalties available? Um, trouble damages? which can be both a deterrent uh, for violations and an incentive to bring lawsuits. And the balance to strike here, um, and a difficult balance, is between effective enforcement and manageable administrative costs. Uh, in general, rent regulation doesn't require state or local governments to spend money directly, uh, but enforcement is one area where um, real direct expenditures can come into play. So I'll plant a few seeds here about the research based on rent regulation um, that we can return to in more depth with Libby, Jenny, and Ed in a few minutes. Oh. Um, and I'll just note that it's difficult to produce robust studies of rent regulation. Um, rent regulation laws don't change very often. And when they do, they don't change randomly. Cities and states that enact rent regulations are different from those that don't. Um, I'll highlight just two recent studies that have some methodological strengths, um, and I'm sure we'll talk more about these or other studies. Um, but first, Rebecca Diamond and her co-authors leveraged the expansion of um, rent regulation in San Francisco in 1994 and found that tenants in regulated units paid lower rents and stayed in their homes longer, but that regulations led some landlords to diminish or convert their units, ultimately leading to reductions in the supply of rental housing and to higher rents citywide. Brian Asquith studied the effects of increased housing prices in San Francisco and found that landlords responded to rising prices by withdrawing their units and buildings from the regulated system. I'm looking at these two studies um, and at the research base more broadly, I wanna suggest a few things. First, um, that research suggests to us that rent regulation can be an effective housing stability mechanism, but it also suggests that rent regulation 
is not very effective at targeting benefits to the lowest income households, that it tends to benefit sitting tenants uh, with lower rents and housing stability, um, and to burden tenants who are not in regulated housing or who want to move in in the future. And I leave this here. I'm happy to be in touch about rent regulation with anyone who has further questions. Um, all I wanted, I wanted to just um, conclude by saying that the research really affirms the existence of these trade-offs um, and affirms the fact that each component of rent regulation works with the others. So we need to think about them um, in context. And with that, I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Sophie, for that overview of all of the many dimensions of rent regulation policies. As we move on in our webinar this afternoon, I'd like to invite our other panelists to join us. So we have Ed Getz joining us. For those who are local, Ed is the director of the Center for Urban and Regional Affairs and a faculty member at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. And Jenny Schutz is joining us from Brookings Metro of the Brookings Institution. So Dr. Schutz has written numerous peer-reviewed journal articles on land use regulation, housing prices, and urban amenities. So I welcome both of them to our conversation. And the three of us, will, the four of us, three panelists will be having a conversation about key pieces of this. As Sophie and Ed begin some introductory remarks, I would remind everyone to add questions to the Q&A link at the bottom. But first I'd like to ask both Ed and Sophie, Ed and Sophie, Ed and Jenny, I apologize, Ed and Jenny to respond to Sophie's comments. So having just heard Sophie's opening overview, where do you agree with Sophie's framing of the key issues in rent stabilization and rent regulation? And where would you like to propose an alternative framing of the key issues and challenges facing local policymakers? So Ed, why don't you go first? Thank you, Libby. And uh, thank you, Sophie, for the overview. Frankly, there, there isn't anything that I, would, uh, that I would argue with. I think that there were several uh, points that Sophie made that I, um, that I would try to uh, reinforce because I think they're so central to our consideration of uh, rent stabilization regimes. And, and the first one is that although municipalities are faced with a number of discrete policy design choices and options that, uh, that really one does need to think about how they are all going to work together and that there are sometimes you can achieve trade-offs by deciding in one way related to rent caps and in another way related to whatever exemptions you uh, you offer. And so, uh, so I'd really like to reinforce what she said uh, that these discrete policy design choices shouldn't be considered in isolation. Um, I think uh, the second thing that uh, that I would like to uh, emphasize is that it's, re it's really hard to overstate the options that are available to local governments when they're, when they're considering rent stabilization uh, programs and what it's going to look like. I think within each of the areas that Sophie covered, there are a number of different uh, questions to be answered, but there are also uh, almost an unlimited way a uh, number of ways to answer those questions. Let's take a rent cap as one example. As, as Sophie noted, uh, some jurisdictions will decide on a fixed rate of, uh, of increase. Some will prefer a variable rate. And then she also noted that in New York City, uh, they have a system where the rent board essentially sets the rent cap from year to year. Um, this can vary by the type of occupant, uh, as uh, Sophie noted about this vulnerable population uh, protections in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere. And even if you've agreed that the CPI is going to be your measure of inflation uh, that you will peg your cap to, are you going to be looking at the housing component of the CPI or the overall component of the CPI? Um, and supposing that the decision is to be made between a fixed cap versus a variable cap, uh, 
We also know that in some cities, they do a combination of the two where they will have a rent cap set at the CPI, but with a higher limit or a lower limit above or below which the rent cap uh, cannot go. So the point I'm trying to make is that um, local governments really do have a lot of freedom to tailor their solutions to, uh, to what works locally. And, um, and those options uh, really should be, um, should be considered. And the last, my last point uh, is that I think um, one thing I don't know that uh, Sophie touched on this was, was that sometimes uh, rent stabilization programs and the responses of the central actors to rent stabilization uh, may require consideration of complementary policies, policies that aren't rent stabilization per se, but that have something to do with enhanced tenant protections, perhaps to, to, re, uh, to respond to uh, the increased incentive to move tenants out of buildings if vacancy deep control was chosen, or policies related to uh, conversion of units uh, into condominiums or demolition, uh, et cetera. So, uh, so I think when we talk about rent stabilization, there are those core questions to, to answer, uh, but we, we need to also think about what complementary policies may be necessitated. Jenny, same question to you. Where do you agree with Sophie's framing or as additions thereof? on the key issues in rent stabilization and where would you like to propose an alternative approach? Um, so Sophie did a great job of explaining sort of how the dimensions of rent stabilization can work together. And the I think the trade-offs framework is exactly the right one. I actually wanna step back and give a little bit of a broader context for why local governments are showing renewed interest in rent regulation um, and thinking about this in sort of the larger context of housing, housing problems facing local governments and the range of housing policy solutions in addition to rent regulation. Um, you know, so local governments in the last maybe three to four years have been particularly interested in looking at rent regulation for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that uh, rents and housing costs more generally have been going up faster than incomes and particularly for incomes at the bottom end of the income, income distribution, right? So we're seeing this growing gap between what it costs to provide housing to low income households and the amount of money low income households can afford to pay, right? And we know that you know many, many decades ago, the federal government provided more generous support um, but that that has been shrinking over time. So now roughly one in four or one in five low income households receives a direct housing subsidy from the federal government, right? This means there are an awful lot of poor families everywhere in the country who can't afford rent. Local governments wind up bearing a lot of the costs of unstable housing, families moving from place to place, um, you know, kids not having stable housing, which hurts their performance in schools, you know, when it gets to sort of the extreme example of homelessness, the costs of this are really borne by local governments. So what we're seeing is local governments looking for ways that they can step in and plug this gap, while also recognizing that local governments don't have pockets hide things like housing vouchers to most poor families. So rent regulation is attractive for a lot of places because it's a way of creating or preserving below market apartments without having a direct ongoing subsidy from the local government with sort of the asterisk that Sophie mentioned that it does require some cost to administer and oversee the program, right? So I would sort of put rent regulation along with things like inclusionary zoning as this set of tools that local governments are interested in to plug the gap for low income households. Um, the one thing to remember with this, as Sophie pointed out, though, is that rent regulation is not generally means tested. So although it creates some below market rate apartments, it doesn't necessarily match that up with low income tenants. Um, and so we can wind up in situations where you have relatively higher income tenants who are living in rent regulated units, right, that they may have been in for a while, 
Um, and depending on how broad the coverage is, there may be low income families who are not in rent regulated units who are not getting the benefits of this. Um, and in particular, that's likely to happen if there aren't enough rent regulated units to go around. So I would say the second sort of framing for why local governments are kind of scrambling is that we know an awful lot of places, including the Twin Cities, simply don't have enough, uh, enough housing units, enough homes to go around. Um, that we haven't been building enough homes to keep up with population growth and job growth since the Great Recession. So there's a shortage of homes, right? And I, I wanna put that on the table because rent regulation can provide stability to people who get access to rent regulated units. It's not directly a way of addressing the lack of overall supply, right? So a well-designed program may not have supply disincentives. It may not discourage units from being added, but it doesn't add units, right? So there's this sort of set of problems poor people who aren't getting subsidy and the federal government isn't providing enough subsidy, not enough homes to go around, rent regulation is not a direct solution to either one of those problems. So what we want to think of it as maybe a set of policies that could work in conjunction with others, right? But just to be clear that if you're trying to address either the lack of subsidy or the lack of units, that it will need to be done complementarity. Um, and I say this in part, I'm, I'm calling in today from Oregon um, Oregon passed a, a statewide anti-rent gouging uh, law several years ago. They did this actually strategically as a set of statewide policies. One was around tenant protections and rent regulation, but they also did this at the same time that they passed um, a set of laws to increase the supply of housing statewide, in particular legalizing duplexes and triplexes in most residential neighborhoods, making it easier to build additional housing. Um, and this was both a policy choice and a political choice to package sort of tenant protections with supply enhancing rules at the same time. And so I think that's a useful framing for local governments also to think about how are you intending to use rent regulation relative to all of the other tools in your policy toolbox and which one of these tools are going to address different kinds of problems. Thank you, Jenny. So Sophie's overview identified some of the key trade-offs to manage and Ed emphasized that as well as Jenny in your opening remarks. So the question that we'd like to set you up for is which of these tensions do you see as the most important to manage or how do you prioritize what's the preeminent consideration amidst all of the considerations and all of the plethora of options that Ed outlined? So would any of you like to take that one on? Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm going to give the classic economist answer, which is it depends. Uh, and in part, it, I think it depends a lot on the local market context, um, but the, the market context and also I think what else the local government is doing and importantly, the, the capacity of local government. So I want to actually want to pick up on a point that Sophie made, uh, which is talking about sort of how difficult uh, or complicated it is for these programs to be administered by local governments. So I think this is actually a good starting point for a place that's instituting a program. Um, these programs can get very complicated in a hurry, right? So a lot of these trade-offs sort of, you know, what are the conditions for, uh, for allowing conversion or movements out? You know, if a landlord does renovations and tries to pass that along in rent increases, can they do that? How did they do that? documented. So these details make the program more complicated. A more complicated program requires more intensive effort to implement and oversee on the part of the staff. And so sort of a starting point would be if you if you don't have a bunch of staff who are kind of there and available and trained and ready to do this, make the program relatively simple. <laughs> um, you know, and that sort of gets, you know, takes some of these, uh, I think some of the dimensions a little bit off the table. So, uh, you know, a simple straightforward program would be something like, you know, uh, agree on kind of a set of units that will be covered by the regulation, something fairly straightforward, like tying the rent increase to a national index. So it's not something, you know, New York has an entire office of people who figure out what the increase is every year. That's a complicated process, right? So sort of a, a fairly simple and straightforward program is going to be easier to start and to sort of monitor and see how it goes. You know, the other sort of, I think, trade-off to keep in mind is just housing markets that are really hot, where market rents are going up, 
are going to face the, the greatest pushback from landlords when they try to cap it, and particularly when they try to put a, a very tight cap on it, right? So the more the policy is constraining what the market wants to do, the more incentives there are for people to cheat or to push against this, and the, and the more likely there are to be kind of distortions. Um, you know, so a, a market that has, you know, like San Francisco that has very fast growing rents, um, it, trying to constrain that a lot is going to make this a more difficult policy to sort of enforce. Um, and so allowing a little bit more flexibility is likely to be less problematic. A market that's not, that doesn't have rents growing as much, it's not going to distort the outcomes as much, right? So this is sort of understand what your local market is trying to do and then what your capacity is for implementing the program. Sophie, would you like to take this on? Oh, sure. I think lawyers, uh, we also like to say it depends. So I'll lead with that. But um, one set of, uh, I think in addition to what Jenny said, a trade off that um, is top of mind for me, but um, in general, but also in, um, in a lot of the cities that we work with, smaller cities around the country, um, we, you know, we talk a lot about trade offs related to supply, but also housing quality is really um, is vital for, uh, you know, is, is just um, vital for low income renters for everyone. And um, managing the trade off between, you know, ensuring that um, regulated housing is affordable, but that landlords have both the ability and the incentive to um, invest in the quality of housing, um, I think is, I don't know if the most important, but the, the closest I'll come to saying it's, um, it's, it's, at least a, it's at least a very important um, trade-off here. And in, um, and in a lot of the cities that we work with, um, blight, disinvestment, vacancy um, are really core issues and rent regulation um, at a minimum, you know, needs to be paired with um, effective code enforcement strategies with outreach um, to landlords, particularly, you know, to particularly to smaller landlords or less resourced landlords um, to, um, to just encourage and ensure um, the level of investment in housing that meets, um, that meets renters needs and often, right, it has to be part of a, a suite of policies um, to that end. So I would say, yeah, I would say that um, a focus, a trade-off that comes up often in, in our work with cities is, is exactly that, is um, ensuring the quality of affordable rental housing. Thank you. And Anne, the economist and the lawyer have spoken. Yes. <laughs> Yes, um, uh, and spoken well, I would say. I, I would say, uh, it, to my way of thinking, the, the real big uh, trade-off is the balance struck between a reasonable return for owner-operators and, uh, and the core objective of rent, uh, rent stabilization, which is tenant stability. And it strikes me that most of the policy design options and choices uh, provide opportunities to strike that balance. And so any, any decision about vacancy uh, decontrol, I think you would need to ask, how does that affect renter stability? How does that affect rent, renter stability versus the achievement of reasonable returns for owner occupiers? I think, I think that uh, striking that balance and that balance can be seen in uh, many of the policy uh, design choices, and it's it's uh, it's really central to uh, to rent stabilization programs. So each of you has provided an overview about what we know about rent stabilization policies based on the localities and or state governments that have adopted these policies. What are some of the key aspects of these policies that we don't know anything about? So what are the questions that haven't yet been answered in practice or by the existing economic research on rent regulation? And as we're trying to consider the impacts of these, where should we look for the answers? Which should so be I'll say a, yeah. a couple of, yeah, a couple of things that we don't know just because there aren't many examples. Uh, the existing rent regulation programs in the U.S. are mostly pretty long-standing. Um, so New York's, of course, in sort of various generations, goes all the way back to the uh, World War II. 
um, you know, San California and DC date from the late 70s, which was the last period of high inflation. We haven't had many places that have instituted new rent regulation programs that didn't have them before, um, and particularly that sort of started from scratch and implemented it into a new market. Um, Oregon's program, I think, is also particularly interesting because it's statewide and there aren't that many statewide programs. So one of the questions is sort of how housing markets will react depends on sort of how prevalent it is throughout, you know, cities and counties within a region, um, you know, if, if um, if one, reg if one jurisdiction has much tighter regulations than its neighbors, we would think that it, there might be an incentive to build more rental housing in the unregulated jurisdictions and sort of you know, have less growth in the regulated jurisdiction. But if you have a statewide policy, it gets around that sort of you know, neighboring jurisdiction issue. So I think these are some of the things that we don't know uh, in the US context. I will say that we also, we can learn more from looking at other countries because other countries have versions of rent regulation or tenant protections that look a little bit more like this. Um, and I'd say in general, the evidence there is also pretty consistent that the more restrictive the regulations are, the more um, either sort of cheating there is or the more it restricts the, the rental market from existing. Um, and one thing that we do know from, I think, other places that we haven't talked about so far um, is that when you make it really hard for landlords to get rid of tenants, including this like, you know, tenants who want to stay in a rent regulated unit for 30 years, um, landlords may try to screen out certain kinds of tenants up front um, because it's harder to get them out. Uh, so, for instance, um, in Japan, uh, which has very strong tenant protection, landlords prefer to rent to younger households and students because they're anticipated that they won't stay in the unit that long, that they will turn over, um, and they are more reluctant to rent to families who are anticipated to have a longer tenure of staying in the unit. So I'd say this is just one of these kind of, you know, potentially unintended consequences we want to be careful of, um, you know, to what extent are we not providing protections to the, to the most vulnerable households that this is really intended to benefit. And Sophie, would either of you like to? Sophie. Sure, I'm happy to come in there. And just to say, I mean, these, um, uh, you know, in the, um, with respect to unintended consequences, there's a really fascinating body of research by um, Meredith Grief out of John Hopkins, uh, who interviewed a lot of landlords in, in Cleveland um, and, and found landlords, for example, screening out um, screening for characteristics like uh, screening out unemployed tenants um, because of things like water billing practices. So water billing regimes that shift more responsibility for what that, that make landlords more responsible for water billing in the end, led them to screen out um, tenants that they thought would use more water, um, you know, households with children, people who work from home, things like that. So there's this real, I mean, it's a, um, that, you know, there's an empirical basis for, um, for a lot of those concerns. I, um, one research gap that I would highlight is that we just don't know very much about um, about what what effective enforcement really means in this space. Um, and there are some in, there's some interesting variation in um, both the um, the remedies and causes of action. So who is um, who's not only who's charged with enforcement, but who's allowed to sue to enforce rent regulations? Um, what and what kinds of relief they can get for doing that, um, particularly in California cities, but um, but even in New Jersey, I believe. And um, again, it's hard to, um, yeah, it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a difficult study to design, but I think it would be um, a big boon for local governments if we knew more about what that um, ideal enforcement structure looks like. Ed? So I would, um... I would preface my remarks by saying that even where there is research, there isn't a lot of it. And even where there is some agreement on research findings, um, we're talking about four or five, five or six studies that, um, uh, that found the same thing, which I think is impressive in and of itself. Um, but I think what I want to emphasize here is that it is very difficult to design good research on rent stabilization programs to isolate the impacts of, of any given feature and to look at, the, at, at any given outcome. Um, and so uh, building the research uh, 
profile uh, of rent stabilization is, is important no matter what it studies. Um, and then finally, uh, to answer your question more directly, uh, Libby, I would, uh, giving a local angle, say one thing we don't know about is uh, what is the impact of not exempting new construction? Um, there's no research on that because there have been no programs that have not exempted new construction. And so we hear uh, from the industry that this is a, an obvious disincentive to build new in a marketplace. And we hear from advocates that if developers have the opportunity of setting initial rents and understanding what the, uh, what the uh, incomes will be from that point forward, that it ne shouldn't necessarily be a disincentive. Um, but uh, that's, that's a big gap. Um, well, it's a gap, um, uh, you know, given that's, that uh, St. Paul is the only uh, place to so far uh, go down this road um, uh, makes it interesting locally. So building on that, I'd like to ask a question that came in from an audience member, which is going to Sophie's comments about the various rent guidelines boards and how those are composed. How do politics go into whether it's the rent guidelines boards or more broadly the decision about what the rent ceiling is. And then the follow up to connect to Ed's comment is whether or not a set policy offers more certainty or is the inclusion of having participation in a rent guideline board more inclusive. So Sophie, would you like to start with that one? Sure. I mean, I can start with the picking up the last part first. I can say that the um, the predictability. Thinking about this from the perspective of a develop, developer, but probably um, more so than from tenants necessarily. But um, when we think about the effects of rent regulation, and when we think about the sort of market effects of rent regulation, um, developers are thinking both about the um, about the future of an investment in any particular place over time, but also thinking comparatively about where to build. Um, and so in, in a fixed formula offers more predictability, you know, on both fronts than, um, than something like our rent guidelines board where the, um, where the permitted increase is going to be different every year. Of course, then Jenny can, will speak to this much more eloquently, but there's probably, you know, that's in the context of obviously developers have, broader predictions about which ways, for example, the New York City real estate market will go. But um, so yes, the, and politics, the, the, I'll just talk a little bit about the composition of the New York City RGB, but the, the board has on it both um, landlord members, members who are supposed to represent landlord perspectives and members who are supposed to represent tenant perspectives, um, and, as well as uh, our research staff and then some members who, um, don't represent either group. Um, and so politics comes into play both, um, you know, in the, from at every stage of that process from the election of the mayor to the appointment of the members to the political, um, you know, the political um, standings of each of those constituencies. But um, where doesn't politics come into play with rent regulation writ large? Um, the maybe I'll, I'll pause there and let and let some others come in but um Jenny do you want to pick up yeah I mean I, I just wanted to comment that we are in a really interesting and challenging time to think about setting up something that is indexed to inflation <laughs> uh, you know Oregon purposely chose to link their rent increases to CPI at both as kind of a, a, a transparent and straightforward way to do this. so it doesn't look like they're sort of gaming the system or trying to work things out um, and also just make the mechanism simple right there's CPI you know, add six percent of that and you know that's your your rent cap um, they you know they did this three years ago when we were in a sub two percent uh, inflation world and most people didn't anticipate that we were going to see prices go up. Um, you know, I mean, now you can imagine it getting complicated. So how often is the rent guideline set? And at what point in the year does it change? And if inflation overall is going up by 8%, 
um, you know, a 14% rent increase is allowable under the cap, but that's more than people had anticipated. So there, there are pros and cons to using this link to some sort of an overall inflation. And of course, you know, we haven't seen a period where uh, inflation has actually gone negative, but you could also do that, right? So there may be some period. Um, you know, I will say that when you when you give sort of a cap on this, um, you know, there is an incentive for landlords to say, all right, I'm never going to be able to charge more than you know six percent over the cap, so I will charge the maximum allowed every year because some years I'm going to want to go over that and I can't, right? So I'm going to sort of take the maximum that I can every year to avoid ever taking the dip, even though they might actually need, not need it, right? So there there's there's incentive for game playing, however you structure this. That's just the nature of the the policy. One more point to make as well in, in the politics of this, um, current tenants are, a, in, are a, an active and, and sometimes pretty vocal constituency as are landlords, but one group that um, is not, that is, that is affected by rent regulations and generally not a part of the conversation are future tenants who want to move into a city and who will find different um, housing markets there under rent regulation than um, than without it, and so um, and that's a difficult you know that's um, that was one of the findings from um, from Rebecca Diamond's study you know the effects on um, unregulated tenants and and future um, yeah sort of future residents of the city, but it's very difficult to um, that's not a that's not a a, a real organized constituency. And any comments on this one? No, nope, I think they covered it. So maybe you want to take on, the, be the first to answer the next question, which is the easy question of how do rent stabilization policies advance or hinder racial equity in various regions? Well, I, um, so I think that they do so by the, the, the basic fact that uh, Renters are disproportionately people of color. Uh, renters are disproportionately uh, low income. Uh, and so being able to uh, provide a means for housing stability for uh, renters uh, in general, even in a non-targeted manner, um, uh, still advances the, uh, the overall cause of, uh, of racial equity, simply given um, especially in the Twin Cities, given the, uh, the size of the home ownership gap that, uh, that we face uh, racially. And so, um, so I think that it, it, it does that. I, I will say that um, one of the, I don't know if it's an assumption behind this question, um, is, uh, is the issue of how well targeted uh, rent stabilization programs are. And um, I will just say that um, to my way of thinking uh, that the targeting issue has is something of a red herring uh, to me um, in the sense that it, um, it that rent stabilization provides benefits to renters uh, across the board and the fact that in some places the magnitude of the savings are greater for uh, higher income uh, tenants um, doesn't strike me as a significant um, criticism of, uh, of the approach. I think um, implied in some of our answers that you've got is that one way to improve the targeting of, of rent stabilization programs is to limit the exemptions um, and to think about who lives in the units that you are uh, thinking about exempting. Um, so for example, small uh, rental units in small buildings, one to four unit buildings. Uh, I think we need to answer the empirical question, which is um, what types of households live in those uh, rental units? And do we know what the racial makeup is or what the income uh, makeup is of tenants in those buildings versus tenants in, in larger buildings, older buildings versus newer buildings. To the extent that we can identify uh, where vulnerable populations or populations we simply want to target, where they live within the rental market, we need to make sure that uh, those units are covered in the, uh, in the rent stabilization program. Jenny or Sophie, would either of you like to think about how rent regulation policies 
advance or hinder racial equity or respond to Ed's comment about the income targeting issue? Yeah, I, I think um, I think Ed is exactly right that sort of this is going to play out differently in different cities because it's you know really sort of looking at which units are covered by the regulation and then mapping those onto neighborhoods, right? So there's a there's a new working paper out using in uh, the Furman Center's data, uh, looking at at New York and you know Manhattan has a bunch of rent regulated units that are much, much below what the market rate would be because it's a very expensive market. Um, most of the tenants who live in rent regulated units in Manhattan, they're more likely to be white and they're more likely to be high income because Manhattan is white and high income compared to the rest of New York City, right? Whereas the rent regulated units in say the Bronx are not as far below market, right? The, the market rate rent would not be that much higher than it is. So it's not as, as much of a break, right? So I think that may be what Ed is talking to is that the, the monetary gains are greater to sort of, you know, higher income white households living in Manhattan than to, you know, black and Latino households living in the Bronx. Um, you know, that said, if it's sort of, uh, it's, it, it's very hard, I think, to design a rent regulation program where you are only providing protections and caps in sort of low income minority neighborhoods. Um, and, you know, I would say that presumably one of the goals of both things like rent regulation and inclusionary zoning is that you can potentially have below market rate units, not just in low income neighborhoods, but in high income neighborhoods, in high opportunity communities, potentially closer to jobs or to transit, right? That is one of the social goals of, you know, things like vouchers as well to make sure that there are rental units that are accessible to non-rich households in high opportunity communities. You know, I, I think it is worth stepping back to kind of my original framing. If one of the goals of a policy is to increase that access, what are the possible range of tools you could use? You could also throw something like acquisition of existing apartments in high income communities and putting them under, you know, adding some subsidy to them as a direct way of opening up those neighborhoods, as opposed to something like rent regulation citywide, which will get you some of that, but also have, you know, spillovers in other neighborhoods. So we're moving toward our end, but Jenny just brought up the issue of alternative or complementary policies that work in conjunction, either work in conjunction with rent stabilization or could simply be alternative policies that achieve some of the same goals. So I'd like to ask each of you to highlight a few alternative or complementary policies that you think should be considered in more detail. So Sophie, would you like to start with this one? Sure, I can start. I think um, one set of complementary policies to going to the, con the um, concerns that I raised earlier about the quality of rental housing. Again, there are um, a lot of innovative programs across the country that provide landlords, uh, that can provide landlords with um, assistance in that the needs take different forms. So capital assistance or kind of in-kind technical assistance for housing repairs, um, code compliance, things like that. I think, um, yeah, are an important complementary set. I think there's um, a reason that, that jurisdictions are talking a lot about just cause eviction and rent regulations um, together. And those are a set of, that's, that's a situation where rent regulation is really a complementary policy um, to just cause eviction and to avoid the scenario, to avoid a scenario in which landlords um, with the, uh, carry out what are sometimes called economic evictions. In other words, evict tenants by raising rents rather than through um, a formal eviction process. Um, we in the housing stability space are also seeing you know, um, something that's very encouraging to me, which is the expansion of access to counsel for tenants, low-income tenants and eviction proceedings, um, because um, the more the more of these tenants, the more tenant, the more protections tenants have in different jurisdictions. Um, uh, you know, in many cases, the more help they need asserting those rights, um, whether they've been overcharged for rent or um, or are being evicted. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think those are a few to start us off. Thank you. Ed, alternative or complementary policies? Sure. I mean, I think when we, if we're talking about, uh, you know, addressing the uh, affordable housing crisis, it's an all hands on deck situation, right? We need to be doing uh, everything from the 
the broad new production uh, programs that Jenny spoke about in her opening remarks um, to the ones that are specifically uh, complementary to uh, to rent stabilization. So I would agree then also with, with what Sophie said. I think what I would add um, are uh, other efforts to achieve um, displacement mitigation. Um, I think that uh, there are a number of organizations that have emerged over the last 10 years or so with anti-displacement as a, as a focus of their work. And uh, that could be preserving existing affordable housing, thinking about the NOAA situation and how we, how we keep those units uh, affordable over time. It can be uh, any number, it, it can be the tenant protections that Sophie was talking about, et cetera. So I think the most relevant set of accompanying uh, policies would be those that have an anti-displacement um, uh, perspective to them. Jenny. Yeah, so I, you know, I think that Focusing on the unsubsidized older affordable housing stock is really important um, because it's in threat from two different directions. One is that many of these older buildings are getting to the end of their useful life. They have significant maintenance problems and often the landlords don't have the money to repair them. Um, and so they may fall out of stock altogether or that the landlord is forced to sell the property to somebody who does a gut rehab and then it becomes much more expensive um, and essentially becomes not part of the, the cheap housing. So I think those are really an opportunity for providing potentially grants or low cost loans for rehab and those can be given with conditions that then affordability is maintained for some period of time. So the landlord is essentially, you know, gets the money to repair the building, but then keeps it as affordable, uh, you know, for some longer period of time. Um, you know, also things like acquisition of properties that can be owned by either public agencies or nonprofits, particularly with a focus on high opportunity places. Uh, you know, there's a flood of federal money coming down from ARPA, um, you know, some of the funding from infrastructure for energy efficiency. This is a great time to be thinking about how to use those targeted subsidies to increase the supply of designated affordable housing um, that reverts to, um, you know, to public regulation, but not through regulating private landlords, but through direct ownership. So I think all of those are really worth exploring. And in general, you know, making it easier to increase the supply of rental housing. So all of the kinds of zoning reforms, uh, you know, reducing parking requirements, you know, building code streamlines, anything that makes it easier to just build more rental apartments is going to be helpful for, for renter households across the board. Thank you for that answer. We're now moving into the wrap up. I would like to thank all three of you for your time, energy, and thoughtfulness in today's remarks. You are adding tremendously to our regional pool of knowledge. So I thank you very much. And now I'm handing it over to my partner, Stephanie Brown with the Urban Land Institute. Thank you to you all. Uh, as I'm sure you guys have grasped, this is not an hour long conversation, but a very uh, robust and rich one for us to dig into. And so this is the first of four sessions. The next session will be on May 4th, uh, will be on the economics of the rental market. We'll have David Garcia from the Turner Center for Housing Innovation and Jacqueline Wong from Stanford University to really dig into how do banks and developers price risk? What are the implications there? What is a reasonable rate of return and how do we think about it? And which renters win and which renters lose in these systems? How do we think about that? The next session will be on May 20th. That's really going to be on lessons learned from implementation. And we'll have guest speakers in the executive director of the rent, Berkeley Rent Stabilization Board, the director of legislative advocacy for the Oregon Law Center, and uh, Matt Murphy with the Furman Center who has been integral in New York City's program. So this will be a really great opportunity to really hear what does it take to run one of these programs? How do you think about where the enforcement burden uh, exists and how to make sure that there's effective communication to all parties? Uh, and then the last session will be on alternatives uh, or complementary policies. So what are some of these other areas we were digging into with the last question that we got to? We have captured all of your questions and they anything that wasn't covered today will help to shape and inform how those conversations stand up. And we will make sure that everyone registered for today's webinar can both get the recording of this session and we'll get the registration links to future sessions. 
So thank you so much to all of our panelists. Thank you to Libby for moderating a really rich conversation today and much more to come. Thank you very much.